um, we will send it over to Lynn for May 2020 production. Thank you, Katie. Uh, thank you to everyone who showed up for our director's cut and those that have tuned in over the internet. Um, it probably, some of the things we're gonna talk about may be surprises or may not, but uh, I would think the, uh, the magnitude of some of the things will be surprising. So in, in my opinion, the second quarter of 2020 was a five alarm fire for North Dakota's oil and gas industry. Um, the OPEC plus uh, agreement fell apart. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, destroyed 30% uh, of world demand for liquid petroleum products. Uh, the DAPL lawsuit has taken numerous twists and turns as, as we've moved along here. Uh, the Northern Border Tariff, which we haven't talked about a great deal here, but we've been talking about it a lot at the Industrial Commission um, is moving forward. There was a, that application and that has significant long-term um, ramifications for our gas gathering and processing and gas capture programs. And then we have uh, the, what I'm gonna refer to as the federal hokey pokey on the BLM waste rules, the new NEPA rules, and uh, all of this litigation that's going on. So uh, we put rules in, we take rules out, we put litigation in, we shake everything about and we turn everything around and, and then we try to figure out where we are. So literally, uh, I, I think the second quarter has been like responding to a five alarm fire. So let's walk through some of the statistics and I think you'll see that. Uh, May production fell to 858,000 barrels a day. Uh, the last time we were below a million barrels a day was January of 2017, and we were just slightly below a million uh, at that point. We're, we're well below a million in May. Um, I think we're seeing some of that return, and so we hopefully within the next month or two, uh, I think maybe by the time the July numbers come out, we may be back uh, at that million number or, or highest. Um, that represents a 30% drop in production April to May. A new record, you know, last month was a record at 15%. This doubled that. And uh, it is the lowest production uh, since June of 2013. So it's been seven years since we were at this production number, uh, which is an incredible long time. And when I get down to the well numbers, we'll see that it's, it's been five years, uh, five and a half years, since our well, active well number was as low as it was in May. Uh, also, when you look at April uh, to May prices, uh, North Dakota Life Suite cratered uh, April to May even worse, but uh, WTI improved. And, uh, <clears throat> but what we really saw, and Justin will talk probably more about this, uh, we saw differentials to West Texas Intermediate uh, expand tremendously. So the average differential between West Texas Intermediate and North Dakota crude oil for the month of May was $14. And that's on a $28 barrel. So the, the price was terrible. The differential was even worse. Uh, and, and so uh, again, there was no incentive for North Dakota operators to produce and market uh, North Dakota crude oil unless they had that crude oil hedged. And, and there was a significant amount of hedging that was out there and that's kind of what sustained activity uh, as it was in the month of May. Uh, natural gas fell roughly the same, 29%. Again, the largest decline in natural gas production month to month ever. Uh, month ago, it was I think 14, 15%. So the largest decline ever. Uh, the rig count, dropped again. Uh, so today we're at uh, 10 or 11. I think it was 10 this morning when I checked and, and then a rig moved. And so it's at 11 now, two hours later, but it, it's extremely low. That's an 82% decrease uh, since January. So in just five months time, uh, I guess now seven months time, uh, we've seen 82% of the drilling rigs idled that were operating in the state of North Dakota. Uh, when we turn to the inactive well count, 
highest ever, 6,100 inactive wells. That's almost triple uh, what it was in April. So that matches up with what we saw in the production decline. And uh, what is interesting when we get to the well numbers is that the, the complete flip. So in April, uh, conventional wells were, were really targeted heavily and we saw the lowest number uh, of conventional wells that, that we had seen in, you know, in my history at the oil and gas division. In May, that flipped, and uh, so there were 1,200 conventional wells put back on and 4,000 Bakken wells shut in uh, for average over the month of May. So, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, Justin's been doing some work on what kind of wells were shut in and what maybe caused them to, to shut in. Uh, in April, it looked like there was a pretty consistent reason. It was the high water producers. In May, it's anybody's guess. Every operator was shutting in everything. And so uh, we just saw a tremendous decline. When we turn to the Fort Berthold statistics, uh, again, uh, we saw plus one drilling rigs there. So the, the few drilling rigs that we have now, um, more than a third of them are operating on Fort Berthold, but we saw a 31% decline in oil production and uh, in terms of wells waiting on completion, it tripled from April. So the one frac crew that's operating in the state is not working on Fort Berthold. And so the drilling that's going on there is all duck wells. They're, they're not completing those wells. And, and so the inventory build on Fort Berthold is 100% is ducks. And, uh, and those wells are not being completed. The, the only completion activity we're aware of is a company with a lot of hedges. Uh, and that company, though, also is moving that oil through DAPL. So they had protected themselves from the market, but uh, they're, they're not protected from a DC Circuit Court decision. And, and so we'll see how that all plays out. Uh, and of course, crude oil takeaway, we'll, we'll let Justin talk about that, but right now capacity's fine today. And, and we've got more than adequate capacity for what we think is a million barrels a day being produced today. Uh, the unemployment figure for the oil and gas sector has risen to over 2,000, or over 10,000, I'm sorry, 10,250 uh, is where we pegged that number uh, as of Thursday. So that represents probably 20% unemployment uh, in that sector which is a, an enormous number and, and which is why we are pushing so hard to get this um, plugging and reclamation project underway so that we can put some of those folks back to work. On the gas capture side, good news, uh, we hit 90%. Uh, statewide Bakken, 92% off the reservation, and uh, but we're really still lagging on Fort Berthold at 82%, pretty much across the board. And now, uh, there's a federal judge decision in the North Circuit in California that vacates the 2018 uh, BLM flaring rule and in 90 days puts the 2016 flaring rule back in place. And that is designed to seriously impact federal uh, and tribal or trust wells. So that may raise the gas capture number on Fort Berthold, but it will do it at the expense of crude oil production. It, it will mean shutting in wells uh, in order to uh, accommodate that 2016 rule uh, if that goes in place. Uh, a little bit of other activity on the federal side. Uh, you're all aware that uh, two days ago, the new NEPA rule or executive order was rolled out. Uh, and I guess we're just kind of waiting for the legal challenges to that, to, to hit the courts. Uh, it's been promised that it's gonna be lit litigated. And then three days ago, uh, the FEMSA, um, let me see, what do I wanna call it? What did FEMSA do? They, uh, 
they preempted Washington, the state of Washington's, I was looking for the word preemption. So the FEMSA preemption uh, passed the milestone for a court appeal and no for court appeal was filed. So um, the FEMSA preemption of the Washington oil uh, vapor pressure standard will stand. And uh, so the North Dakota Industrial Commission is gonna take a look at its own standards and see what, if any, action might be appropriate for us to do uh, in view of the, the FEMSA preemption. So that's a lot to unbundle and uh, we'll just take some questions. But uh, seriously, the second quarter of this year was a five alarm fire. And, uh, and if you're looking at litigation and federal rules, I think the hokey pokey is what it's all about. Any questions in the room? Yeah, do you wanna, um, you've been on the oil business for a very long time. And uh, you've you know, seen a lot of ups and downs and you know, I feel like this month of you know, main production and where things have gone and down this time around. Can you just talk about kind of how this month of May stacks up to other crashes that you've seen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the question was, how does the month of May, uh, with everything going on, stack up to the other uh, price collapses or, or crashes that I've seen? And um, I, I think it's equal to uh, the 1999 price collapse when we actually saw zero drilling rigs operating in the state. Uh, and I saw crude oil, uh, in northern North Dakota selling for $3.86 a barrel. Uh, in May, you know, we actually saw some negative oil prices. And, and so um, Flint Hills, uh, and, and that's where, you know, the May North Dakota Light Sweet, you know, really was a blowout. It dropped to less than $8 a barrel for North Dakota Light Sweet. And that was because uh, Canadian Light was worth basically nothing. And uh, so, North Dakota, Northern North Dakota crude oil was competing for pipeline space with that. So it's equal to that. It's nearly as bad as the 1986 uh, collapse. I, I don't think um, in terms of numbers so far, it quite measures up to that one. Uh, and it's significantly worse than what we saw in 2015-16. So, uh, you know, it, it, it ranks uh, probably number one or number two depending on how long it goes on, the 86 collapse was very, very long. And so um, if the EIA is correct, and this time next year, uh, demand for liquid petroleum fuels is back to pre-COVID pandemic, then uh, it'll, it'll fall, you know, probably into second or third place. But if this extends uh, longer than that, then it would it would rank as probably our worst. And would you mind just real briefly talking about what was going on during the ninety nine price collapse and the eighty six collapse? I'm just not familiar with the details of what <laughs> happened then. Okay, so let's go back to nineteen eighty six. Uh, the nineteen eighty six collapse uh, occurred because the OPEC nations. Uh, imposed an embargo in 1973, and then the Iranian Revolution occurred in 1979, and that led to uh, uh, extreme high prices that were unsustainable. So again, the, the U.S. industry responded by using new technology, which was 3D seismic, to find lots of crude oil reserves, and that forced OPEC into, a, again, a declining market share and so in 1986, they opened the taps and flooded uh, the world markets and, you know, basically destroyed the, the U.S. oil and gas industry for about a decade. So then we moved to 1999, and 1999 was the advent of uh, massive offshore discoveries. So deep water Gulf of Mexico and uh, West Africa and several of those discoveries came on. And again, the world market was flooded and prices collapsed. <clears throat> 2015 was the world financial crisis brought that about. 
And of course, the one that we're living through was brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, I've, I've been in too many of these, eh? <laughs> are, you, are you thinking that the uh, EIA uh, prediction is right on or false? Or what, what are you thinking about that? Or how confident are you? Sure. So the, the question was, how confident, how do I feel about the EIA projection that a year from now, uh, world demand will have been restored? And I think it's a, a little optimistic, to tell you the truth, Dave. I think maybe the timing is not that bad that, that we'll see whatever demand recovery we're going to see by that time, because uh, we're seeing such great news about uh, the vaccine and, and all of that. And, and so, you know, I think, I think we'll be looking at uh, COVID like we look at the influenza by that time. But I think, you know, there is going to be permanent demand destruction, I think, as a result of a, a shift uh, to more electric vehicles and less air travel and um, some of those things. So I, I think we're going to see a permanent change in the world economy and, and the world's demand for liquid petroleum fuels. So I, I think the timing is very reasonable, but I, I'm not sure that the world is ever going to return to pre-COVID uh, demand numbers. I, I guess in that case, it, I know you're kind of working on mitigation so far right now, but you say there's going to be that permanent destruction, and that's kind of something that's been trending that way for, for several years now. Does oil and gas or the state in general kind of have a plan moving forward into the rest of the 21st century mm -hmm. as far as adapting? Yeah, so the question was, does the state of North Dakota and the oil and gas industry have a, a plan for adapting to this new uh, dynamic, which is uh, permanent demand destruction? And uh, we have a plan. We call it the Legacy Fund. Uh, you know, it was built on the idea that ultimately uh, either world demand for crude oil would peak or North Dakota production would peak and then begin to decline. Um, the legacy fund isn't as large, isn't large enough yet to really deal with that. So I think we're going to have to, you know, shift some of our spending ideas and spending priorities and uh, how, how we are going to fund state government going forward. And, and of course, um, right in the middle of a crisis is probably not a good time uh, to, to try to figure all that out, but it is going to be a huge topic in the next legislative session. So when all of our friends come to town in January, uh, that, that's going to be the real topic of discussion is where do we think world petroleum demand is, is going to max out? What's going to happen to future oil prices? And how does the state of North Dakota uh, situate itself uh, to, to best manage or, or handle that? Now, having gone through 1986, and 1999, and 2015, and now 2020, uh, you'd think we, we ought to be able to get a handle on this. And of course, the Legacy Fund is the, is the best tool we have, uh, and, and that's going to be super important going into the future. But there probably need to be some other budgeting decisions or spending decisions made uh, that, that take us maybe back towards this idea that we don't spend oil and gas tax revenue until it's in the bank, that we don't base future spending on anticipated revenues, but uh, we, we base it on what's in the bank. And I know that that causes a lot of angst. So in the, during the boom days of the Bakken, a lot of money was being put in the bank and there was a lot of demand to spend that money or, or put it to work. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that then you begin to count on production and prices and, and revenues uh, that may, for the most amazing reasons, uh, evaporate. And so what did we call them? Black swans? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we had a whole flock of them land this year. <laughs> so does that mean we're going to probably see less buckets? 
Um, yeah, the question was, does that mean we're going to see less buckets? Um, I would think so. Uh, and I, I would think probably even more than that is we're going to reprioritize those buckets and change, you know, where the oil revenues flow to and, you know, how, how they sit waiting for the next legislature to spend them. So we may uh, eliminate a few buckets, but we're certainly going to have to reprioritize. Uh, and if you'd be able to comment on this, uh, there's something like 34 companies that are overdue in payments to uh, the Public Schools Trust Fund. Hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. That that's <laughs> the the question was uh, the the overdue royalty payments to the trust fund. Um, sorry, John. Not something I'm familiar with. Uh, not surprising. I I think when you look at these oil prices, and I uh, you know when you look at North Dakota market prices of nine fifty and and fourteen twenty seven, um, the cash flow for these companies uh, is little to non-existent and so I, I think that they uh, they've really struggled to make the required payments and we're still anticipating I know we've had a couple of bankruptcies uh, well actually three now but unless we get some significant price improvement and uh, and some certainty about Dakota Access Pipeline there's more to come in that area. something for me on inactive wells and I think you spoke about this last month but if a well is inactive does that mean that it's actually producing literally nothing or could could some of these wells be producing just like a barrel or two every now and then? Yeah the question was about that inactive well number. Our inactive well number means zero production for the month. It means no days on no production. So the, the operators are required to report even if they shut the well down completely. And so we don't put a well into inactive status unless it, it reports zero days on zero production. And, and so um, there's a whole another group of wells that have been operating, I don't know, it's probably in the 2500 range of wells, Justin, that have been operating maybe an hour or two a day or one day a week uh, or two days a week and those uh, would fall into a, a restricted production category they wouldn't be counted as inactive they, they would show up on our reports as a day on or actually producing some oil or gas okay. so then it's just saying the math here there's 6,000 wells roughly inactive in May and then another 2,500, so about 8,500. That means about half of the wells that were active before the pandemic um, basically been idle, either entirely or to a large extent. I think that's pretty close, yes. So, uh, yeah, yeah, your your math indicates that um, about or over a third of the wells have been completely inactivated uh, as of May. Uh, you know, in, in the month of May, and then there would be another group about half that large or to a third, uh, between a third and a half that large that have been, are being idled uh, either 20 hours a day or five days a week. Uh, and they're uh, essentially keeping the mechanical system operating, but producing little to no oil and gas. And the, the whole point of that was companies trying to avoid the major expenditure of putting a completely idled well back on. From what we know about North Dakota production, our wells uh, have a lot of salt in the produced water, a lot of sand in the produced fluids. And uh, so if you completely idle the mechanical system, more than likely, it's going to require the intervention of a workover rig and, and significant cost to put it back on production. So they've been trying to avoid that. How many frack crews are currently operating right now? And um, 
do we feel like the rig count number has reached its bottom or could we possibly see a few other rig losses? All right, Katie gets to ask two questions at once. <laughs> <laughs> so our intelligence tells us that there's one frack crew operating that uh, they had actually, uh, the week before the uh, DAPL uh, judge's decision, uh, they had activated or, or were in the process of activating a second crew and there was a third crew on deck, but those guys were put on hold, uh, perhaps with this stay, if, if it gets a little more traction and folks feel like it's, it's gonna be real, uh, we could go from one to three. But right, right now, uh, they're at one. And, uh, but as John Wayne said, we're burning daylight. Uh, this is the prime time of year to be fracking wells. So um, there's gonna be some pressure to, you know, maybe mobilize crew two and three. But, but for the time being, we're at one. Uh, the 10 drilling rigs, 10 or 11, is probably the bottom or very close to it. But we have one operator that have stated, you know, with the federal hokey pokey going on, they are, are committed to running two rigs uh, to develop all their federal leases, all their federal permits, uh, and then they plan to drop one. So, so we could lose one or two. Uh, I do have several questions that have come in um, wanting to know when we may get back to those pre-pandemic production levels or what that cadence would look like, mm. um, or any estimates on when we might uh, at least see that 1.4 million barrels per day. Okay, so um, my best guess is that we're a year out from those kind of numbers, that it, it will take us a year or more, uh, you know, maybe into the fourth quarter of next year before we can see pre-pandemic uh, production levels. And again, that that's going to somewhat demand, uh, depend on is there significant permanent demand destruction, but uh, North Dakota is well placed to put wells back on and, and to get back to work as oil prices rise. And we're doing a lot of things to preserve workforce and to incentivize uh, wells being kept on or being put back on. So I, th I think uh, we'll be able to sort of lead the pack when the price signals are there. Now the, you know, I can't emphasize enough that the five to six dollar differential of DAPL, no DAPL, is super significant. That that forty dollar West Texas Intermediate price to return wells to production becomes forty five or forty six without DAPL, and the fifty dollar price to actually you know start fracking duck wells becomes fifty five or fifty six, and and the fifty five dollar price to to bring a, a drilling rig out of the yard now becomes 60 or 61. And that's, the, the NYMEX market doesn't get to those numbers. Uh, and, and it may be conservative, but you never see those numbers in the futures market uh, as, as it stands today. So uh, it's impossible to overemphasize how important that is. You spoke a little bit about um, upcoming session and some of the buckets. Do you see a financial impact on other government agencies in the state because of the decline in oil tax revenue um, or state agencies having to make any cuts due to this? Well, we, uh, um, we've been directed by the Office of Management and Budget to submit a uh, minus 15% budget. So uh, all general fund agencies are, you know, looking at that uh, as a potential outcome. Obviously, we're hoping that revenues uh, turn out better than that, but everyone's preparing for that. I do know that the uh, Water Trust Fund has uh, ran smack into reality and has discovered that a lot of the projects that they had on the, the table for this year uh, are going to have to be postponed because the they are 
really entirely de uh, dependent on oil extraction tax revenues, and uh, it's not there. So there's a lot of areas, and, and as John mentioned, uh, royalty payments are not coming in, uh, so that impacts K-12 education, potentially. So there, there's, there's going to be waves and, and ripples of impacts across state government. It's hard to imagine Project Prairie Dog uh, digging very many holes in the, in this environment. So, one um, so here's my new school right now, and you know, they're worried about operating and drilling a well. Um, why, like, why are people still drilling right now? There's a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, there's you know a lot of bad things in the oil industry because the oil industry is hard to access and the drilling the other day, and that creates just a lot of uncertainty. So most of the companies that are, are <clears throat> still active drilling uh, fit into two categories. Uh, they've hedged their oil. So these prices are, are not what they're getting, um, not, not even close. Or uh, they have a significant inventory of federal permits and, and federal leases, and they absolutely are, are highly motivated to get those wells drilled before November. And so that's really, <clears throat> pardon me, that's really what's driving a, a lot of the drilling activity that we're seeing today is uh, oil hedges or, or federal leases. And I think that's why you see uh, the large percentage of rigs working on and around Fort Berthold is that those are federal leases and federal permits and uh, the, the motivation, they're highly motivated uh, to get those wells drilled. W once they're drilled, they're going to be allowed to produce them, uh, even if, if there are major changes in, in federal regulation or administration. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Just one second here, fire up, there we go. Well, good morning everyone, Justin Krinkstead, Director of the North Dakota Pipeline Authority. Uh, several topics to discuss here this morning. Uh, again, many of the same topics that Lynn had brought up. Um, I could touch on them with more of a midstream or a transportation twist to them. So just quickly starting off, uh, neighboring states where they're at with production. April is the latest that we have from both Eastern Montana and South Dakota, but I'm expecting to see at least equal, if not even higher, percentages of, of decreases from those neighboring states as we start uh, to see the main numbers. So, and then the recovery factor will also be different uh, as well um, in those in those jurisdictions because of the way that those oil fields operate. So, we'll keep a close eye on that. Again, much smaller volumes than, than North Dakota, but still important when we look at the, for the overall transportation uh, dynamics. On slide three. Um, as I mentioned last month, uh, we were expecting, uh, obviously, another big decrease in the month of May, but just spatially and, and visually what those monthly changes look like for both oil and gas. It really uh, skewed even the, the charting axis on here. So um, uh, I, I do expect, uh, along with Lynn, um, that May would have been the deepest. Uh, June should be slightly better, but not substantially better uh, from a production standpoint. So we'll, we will likely see just very minor uh, improvements into June and then July. Uh, we're starting to hear reports of things starting to pick up from an activity standpoint. So uh, things, at least for the month of July forward, are, are looking a little bit uh, a little bit better, still nowhere near the, the pre-collapse levels. On slide four, this is just some, some analytics looking at that May production. And um, 
Last month, I, I mentioned how many wells I was classifying in this uh, bucket of what I'm calling or shut-in production, and, and how I'm making up that criteria is if a well from March to May had 75% or greater decrease in its overall oil production levels, um, I put it into that bucket of shut-in uh, production. And so you can see visually on the left, uh, uh, spatially, this was all over North Dakota. Um, it wasn't unique to one specific county, one specific uh, operator. It was uh, by the month of May, um, it was pretty universal across the field uh, where wells were being uh, either shut in or significantly curtailing back their production levels. On the right-hand side, you can see the numbers associated with that. Uh, wells that fit that 75% criteria, um, over 6,700 wells. And, and Lynn was talking earlier uh, about the wells that had zero days on production. It was about two thirds of that 6,700, so just over 4,000. So I think that, that matches up uh, right with Lynn's comments earlier. So um, the other 2,000 plus um, had, they still met this criteria of shut in, but they were still operating more than one or more days in the month, but it was just at a substantially uh, curtailed or lower rate. And then even the wells in the blue category here, the 11,000 plus that weren't considered shut in, uh, we still saw over uh, over 100,000 barrels per day of decrease in overall production from those wells. Uh, and that has to do, I think, uh, a lot with the base decline rates and, and what we're chasing in North Dakota from uh, a well profile and how these, these shale wells age. Um, I could touch on that later if we need to, but um, just mathematically, these wells are all declining over time. And so no matter what happens, a well typically month to month will be decreasing. And in order for North Dakota to at least even hold steady or increase production levels, there needs to be new wells being added each month. And so when you get into months like April and May with very, very low well completions, and even going into June and July, that low well completions, there simply are not enough wells being completed to overcome or overcompensate for the base decline of the existing uh, wells in operation. Then on slide five, this is a, another kind of look at, at those wells that were classified as shut in. And what I've tried to do here is delineate what type of well it was that was shut in and how old was it. And this is meaningful to, to folks in that we can see very clearly that from a volume perspective, which is the bottom half of this graphic, uh, most of the production that was shut in is from relatively new wells and almost exclusively from the Bakken system itself. The gray bars that you see on the top half and the blue bars represent how many wells are in each of those categories. If you look back at the 1980s, even the 50s, you're seeing some, some well counts from legacy production vertical wells from Madison or, or other formations, but their associated production with it is almost negligible. Um, so the question of if those legacy wells if they take an extended period to come back online, if maybe some of them don't ever come back online, from a production standpoint, almost, again, negligible. But what is meaningful is that high, almost exclusive volume of oil that was shut in is from relatively new wells. And, and I do expect that in a reasonable amount of time, the industry is gonna be able to get that production back online. Um, so again, through their operation strategies, the age of those wells, um, it, is, it does provide some level of comfort from a forecasting and, and a market condition standpoint that most of the production is from relatively new wells. It may take some work for the operators, but most of that we can reasonably count on coming back online uh, sometime when the, the pricing becomes appropriate for that operator. And now back to transition to some of the, the traditional slides and looks. Um, I will I'll bump right ahead here to slide seven. From a market perspective, at least in the month of May, everything was depressed. Volumes were down uh, universally, whether it was on a pipe or rail or a refinery. Um, as those lower production levels statewide, uh, lower throughputs and lower utilization for all, uh, all markets. And we did see a, a slight market increase in the percentage of by rail, a decrease in the amount uh, being trucked north into Canada, and then relatively stable market percentages for the pipeline uh, sector. Crude by rail, uh, down somewhere around that 200,000 barrels per day, uh, maybe slightly above for the month of May. 
So that as well is down. Most of the pipeline utilizations had um, empty space on those systems uh, in the month of May. Again, as we get to June and July, that's, that's all transitioning here again as folks are looking for places to put barrels um, as they're coming back online. And then for April, the latest available were those rail destinations, those marketplaces, again, east and west coast, uh, pad one, pad five, uh, continuing to dominate uh, the marketplace. In the event that Dakota Access were to get shut down, um, I would expect to see uh, some shifting around. The east and west coast would likely still be uh, two of the primary markets or the first markets um, until they were saturated with, with what the demand was at the east and west coast. And then I would expect uh, the Gulf Coast as well as Cushing to uh, be increasing in volumes or deliveries out of North Dakota by rail um, as an outlet option. Again, less economic to move by rail to Cushing or to the Gulf Coast uh, than by pipeline. But again, in a scenario with that system shut down and, and shippers having no other alternative, um, I would suspect that it's either those barrels would either go to Cushing or down to the Gulf Coast. Uh, market dynamics, uh, looking at, at the April timeframe, again, that's the latest we have for what the refineries are paying. Again, depressed prices in that time frame universally across the across the U.S. Uh, very sub stark difference between Pad 2 and then again those uh, east and west coast uh, refining markets. So, Pad 2 uh, in the May, the April and May time frame, uh, Lynn is alluding to some of the steep discounts we were seeing um, in the month of May and even April as well. We saw refinery utilization. Nationwide, but again, in, in pad two of the Midwest, significantly down. Uh, a lot of refineries that were purchasing crude oil were looking for a heavier grade. Diesel still had, at least compared to gasoline, still relatively uh, strong compared to the other uh, demand. And so a light sweet barrel like North Dakota that makes relatively more gasoline versus diesel fuel, um, refiners just universally weren't overall real interested in a light sweet barrel like North Dakota. So we, in the month of May, we did see substantial uh, hits from a pricing perspective again, because what the, the marketplace is doing, where the demand was at, um, some of that has now corrected itself and we're back to a more normalized uh, discount level here in July. My estimate is again, somewhere around that seven to $8 range, which is typical uh, for what we were seeing prior to that steep May decline. And then pricing um, here as of this morning, Brent WTI spread still uh, quite narrow. That again is hurting those rail economics. And so that discussion of if Dakota Access is shut in economically, what is the resulting impact on North Dakota? If that Brent WTI spread was extremely wide, if pricing at the Gulf Coast was extremely wide relative to, to Cushing, um, that would help the economics. But in, in, in the reality and where the the forecasted markets are expected to be, um, and the, the rail economics look challenging for incremental volumes out of North Dakota. So if that system shut down and producers and shippers are forced to put those barrels onto rail cars and send them to Cushing or send them to the Gulf, it will be at a price penalty um, in order to do that. Uh, some interesting dynamics in the imports exports. We saw imports into North Dakota drop down uh, substantially. This does capture rail volume, so maybe we shouldn't be overly surprised uh, when Canadian shipments through North Dakota by rail uh, fell off as Canadian production was curtailed and shut in as well. And then we'll, we'll quickly just move to the natural gas side. 1% uh, change, uh, really no big shifts um, and, and why that gas is being flared, just everything was, again, at a lower volume. I'm gonna bump forward all the way to slide 15 and looking at New Wells producing gas, New, New Wells selling gas, this was the lowest uh, New Wells producing gas all the way back to 2006 was the, the last time I saw numbers this low. So uh, again, um, unprecedented uh, levels. We do expect to see some more well completions at a, a much depressed level the rest of the year. Um, so these numbers will likely continue to look quite low uh, for the next several months. And then where does the EIA see oil prices uh, heading? Uh, this will wrap into some of the forecasts you may see here in a moment. Um, 
Over the next several months, the EIA still has prices fairly suppressed uh, before moving into 2021, where they start anticipating higher oil prices and then climbing out of this trough um, by the year 2022 and forward, starting to get to that 50 plus dollar WTI range. On the natural gas front, uh, again, these discussions that we've been having uh, for many months now and, and years, in fact, about gas capture and gas processing because of this uh, decrease. And we knew that going in, and we've talked about this for several months, that one of the one of the benefits will be that we would see less gas flaring. And, and that is true. You can see the purple line at the bottom. Um, gas flaring volumes are, are at a recent low, uh, but again, from the gas sector as a whole, uh, we're still not taking our, our eye off the ball. We know that over the long term on slide 18, looking at the timing of the new plants, expansions, um, these things again take quite a bit of time. And so we're still looking long term at what is in store for the play, what type of infrastructure is gonna be necessary and what the appropriate timing and scope of those projects will be. Um, so with that, I will wrap up my formal uh, comments and um, be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. I guess with the shutdown of Apple and and the pandemic at the same time, I'm, I'm assuming there's room on other pipelines coming out of North Dakota, correct? There is, so in the month of uh, July, so just kind of fast forward to where we are today, um, I would anticipate that uh, there is well, so today, Dakota Access is still in service. Mm -hmm. If Dakota, so let's just fast forward to August. If Dakota Access were to shut down service, stop accepting crude oil in the month of August, um, and every pipeline system was filled up to the brim, that would still leave roughly 300,000 barrels of crude oil that would need to get on a rail car and move uh, from the region by rail. Um, again, I think the east and west coast would be the first markets uh, that that barrel would try to get to. And any, anything that those markets can't absorb would get down to that Cushing or the Gulf Coast. So um, right now, I think the 300,000 barrels per day was previously open space on those other pipelines to directly answer your question. Um, but if those filled up, we would have to again shuffle and ship those barrels onto rail car. Is uh, North Dakota's rail infrastructure ready to start accepting? Uh, yep, so I'm gonna back up here to slide Slide eight. Mm -hmm. So if you look historically over the last year or two, North Dakota has been moving somewhere in that 300,000 barrels per day uh, range. So so the, the crews, the tank cars, the loading capabilities do exist to meet that initial 300,000 barrels per day. In order for North Dakota to continue to grow out of this slump and get to the levels we would expect it to be at by next summer, late next summer, um, on top of that existing 300, we would have to add another couple hundred thousand barrels of rail capacity. And so that would, again, involve more crews, more locomotives, more tank cars, finding destinations for that, those barrels, right? Uh, where, where they're gonna go. So then that would take some time to, to put together. Um, Justin, one thing I sort of struggled in what they were reporting on the various oil tanks and dynamics is to just describe like maybe the average dollar amount that you know, it tends to cost, or you know, rail tends to be more expensive than pipeline. And I don't know if you have like average dollar amount, but I'm not sure how much harder it is to keep. Yeah, so I'm gonna just bump to slide 11 here. Actually slide 10, Katie. Um, so some rough numbers uh, to the Industrial Commission on July 7th, I, I presented some more detailed specifics. And so I'm just gonna to try to recall those by, by memory. So Dakota Access, because that's what we're, most folks are, are talking about, in order to get a barrel from North Dakota to the Gulf Coast on Dakota Access, it's somewhere between six and $8 per barrel. It does not include any gathering costs associated with that in North Dakota. So another say dollar or so. And so in a normal market conditions, that six to six to eight dollars plus a dollar that usually North Dakota's pricing at the wellhead has been averaging that seven or eight dollars below WTI. So that, that transportation cost is fixed and that's why we see that lower price in North Dakota. Uh, some of the rail costs, 
to get to the West Coast, you're looking at probably six or seven dollars just strictly for the rail cost, but then another three dollars on top of that in associated loading, unloading, um, tank car leasing uh, costs, and then plus that other dollar for gathering on top of that. So, uh, so say ten dollars all in when you consider loading, unloading to the West Coast. East Coast is probably a couple dollars higher than that. The Gulf Coast is probably a couple higher, couple dollars higher than the West Coast as well. Again, the West Coast is just proximity-wise closer to North Dakota than the East and, and Gulf Coast is. So, um, and I don't know if that answers your your question or not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just really depending. Yeah, those are all reasonable. Uh, Any additional questions for Justin? Okay, thank you. 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 Thank you.